Hey, it's John Reed. I got Brian Summer with me. And Brian, we are ready to go. The Enterprise Month in Review rolls on. How are we doing? I think we're going to do all right today. So um, Indeed. no shortage Indeed. of material. No, we, we have a lot of interesting material. We have Lawson Abenanti coming on to join us in a little bit. We're going to get a tour de force on how vendors are screwing up messaging and BI and beyond. That should be good. And uh, for those viewers who have not joined us before, Brian, Mike, and I, we will give our uh, top picks and some of our whiffs and kind of give you a sense of what happened this month. And we do have slides. Yay. This is a deck like no other, folks. And it's not NDA either. You can feel free to reproduce this deck and share it with friends and family. Uh, what what's on the agenda there you, we got the cringy buzzwords mm -hmm. we got we got top stories we got our guests and then we got some humorous asides and whiffs whiffs of plenty uh i think ai fatigue is setting in so we might learn something about that today we shall see all right brian shall we shall we march on oh by the way uh viewers please feel free to comment in the chat i need to double check and make sure that those comments are coming through from linkedin so if you can do that I invited some uh, analytics experts onto the call today, a select group. So if you made it, welcome, and please comment in the chat. I want to make sure the commenting system is working properly. And there is Tracy. Happy Friday, Tracy. Always good to see you in the chat. And that tells me that LinkedIn comments are working, which is great. Brian, he didn't. you don't have a buzzword for us this month? What happened, man? Well, you know, usually I'm all over this stuff. Um, and I know I pulled one, a, you know, a few weeks ago. I can't find it, but I was going to say that uh, your favorite word, "auto magical," uh, actually oh. popped up in two vendor briefings that I was in, you know, in the last few weeks. So that one's, you know, like in Billboard magazine terms, is probably like back up to number seventeen with a bullet and uh, moving strong. And I'm sure the "auto magical" had nothing to do with their their AI capabilities. Uh, <laughs> Which I did want to mention in the context of, it's not quite a buzzword, but Brian, I'll bet you did not know, I got this PR pitch today, that July 16th is AI Appreciation Day. <laughs> well, wait, wait till we get to my stories of the month and you may want to retract yeah, that. And, uh, and, okay. But, uh, and, and by the way, data reveals first responders see an AI powered future. So that that's definitely a bold prediction. I love those bold predictions with tight timelines and tight KPIs. Um, by the way, I, um, I responded to that email and I said, um, no offense, but I'd rather jump off a bridge into the Connecticut river than do a piece on AI appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked if AI needs an appreciation day in our industry. Every day is a AI appreciation appreciation day. Is it not? Uh, just for future reference, I said to the PR person, I see my job as debunking tech hype rather than boosting the most well-funded companies on earth. I'm waiting on a response to that email. So uh, I guess I should wait for a little while longer. Well, shall we move on? I, I won't even. <laughs> it's it's a rare PR pitch that I'll respond to in a negative way. Uh, and only because... It's just not worth my time to try and whatever educate the great unwashed masses as to what they've really got wrong here. I mean, I, I hear you, man. But when you when I got that AI appreciation day, I was like, <laughs> I, "Well, I if I get one like that, I'm that's the kind I forward straight to you because I know you're always looking for some killer content." Oh, uh, that Marine's the here. Weekly, Mar uh, I'll bet Mar I'll bet Marine is already working on plans for AI appreciation day. So. Marine, let us know what you're planning. I'm sure it's going to be spectacular. Mm. Um, <laughs> anyhow, all right let let's let let's get back to the to program, Brian, because we only have ten minutes and we got to get lost on here, so it doesn't give us a lot of time to uh to hit our our top stories. Uh, Marine says, uh, just looks forward to understanding my happy shining face, sharing jokes in Slack. Um, all the jokes are on the air, Marine. Nothing's in the back channel on the Enterprise Month in Review. The back channel well, is the front channel. I'll tell you what, Marine. Ask us uh, closer to October, November, because that's when John and I work on the annual unpredictions piece. And 
uh, I, I would say probably half of the items that were written to go in the piece end up on the cutting room floor, and some of them because they are either absolutely filthy or they are <laughs> they're libelous or whatever. But uh, check with us then, and we probably have some better you know things to spin your way. Anyway, John, your top story and. The headline on this, I wanted to kind of blur it out, but uh, I left it just the way it was because it just it says John Reed. I mean, that's what it just reads <laughs> when I read this guy's piece. So um, I imagine this, most of you saw this piece because it's hard to get away from a viral title like I will fucking pile drive you if you mention AI again. Um, that, it, it, look, so this the interesting thing about this piece, it obviously went viral. Um, but you know and it was kind of i think designed to go viral but this was this was actually written by a data scientist which i think is the interesting uh part of the piece now i don't actually agree with all of the piece i think uh there were some aspects of it that i think maybe gave some short shrift to some things that i've seen in the enterprise that are actually working with ai but in general there was some really good takeaways in this piece around basically get your house in order before you work on AI was a really big theme, especially around data. Uh, and Marine liked the piece of amazing piece. Yeah, there was some good stuff in there. Um, and I disagree with some of the stuff. I think like, uh, I think they sold some of the advancements that have been made around enterprise AI a little bit short, but I do understand the AI fatigue that's coming out of that piece. And um, there was another piece I wanted to feature and I kind of messed up uh, and didn't get it into the deck. Right. Uh, but I, I, I recommend it as a companion piece. And it's if you if you search on the AI snake oil substack, which it sounds like a bunch of rants, but it's actually pretty thoughtful stuff on AI. They just put out a new paper on AI agents because AI agents are kind of like the next hype thing. And one of the things we have to be really careful about in the enterprise AI space is always looking for the next shiny new toy as opposed to assessing what's working now. And the agent thing is really interesting because that's what a lot of companies like Google have been pushing this week, uh, this this uh, conference season. Open AI has been pushing this as like the next big thing. Agentic AI, you can see a little bit of that on Diginomica. I've had some good discussions on this. I'm going to be writing about agents. But just to give you an example, uh, in this piece, uh, they put out a white paper, but they also put out a blog post and they said, uh, I ordered DoorDash on the Rabbit R1. It didn't let me choose what I wanted on the dish, and it incorrectly delivered it to my house instead of work without notifying me or without any UI to change that. Uh, it also automatically selected the highest tip option, which is fine, but maybe ask me first. So anyway, this is sort of the danger with agents is that when we have inaccurate output at times, then automating all of that is kind of a problematic fantasy. So watch the agentic AI story because that's going to be a sign that vendors are kicking the can down the road a little bit. Anyway, I want to get through my next stories quickly. Brian, were you going to comment real quick? Well, they have one agent that will book an entire vacation, you know, for you. Oh uh, yeah. What, what could go wrong? Right. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, enough said, uh, <laughs> uh, to say that I have a king size case of doubts on that's fine. That one's viability. Would be an understatement. So, blow us. It's like I wanted to go to Rome, Rome, Italy, not Rome, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, I'm not sure if there's a Rome, Georgia, but you get my drift. My next one. This is. um, This is. I'm not going to go into this hardly at all, but I wanted to recommend uh, if you follow the automotive industry changes at all to check out uh, the blog of Evangelos Samudis. That's one of his pieces. Do a keyword search on that if you want to check it out further, but. I'm a big fan of these sort of industry specific uh, areas around technical disruption and, and authors that really focus on industries. I think that's where we're getting the better insights right now versus the more generic uh, coverage. And then this one also, this was Lewis Columbus, uh, how adversarial AI is creating shallow trust in a, in a deep fake world. And I actually picked this um, not just because deep fakes are actually an enterprise problem at this point because they are it's it's more of a consumer problem obviously when you have elections coming up and you have you know uh, people's pictures being used in in highly offensive ways and manipulated but there are security issues around this that are covered in this piece but the reason i included it is i think one of the overriding themes in the enterprise the next year 
is going to be this confrontation between automagical systems on the one hand and then trust on the other. And and how do we ensure trust amongst trading partners, trust in what we the content we consume? Trust is going to be like a it's it's kind of a cliche, but but I think it's also going to be a really important story. So anyhow, those are my picks. Brian, shall we um press on into yours? Cause we only have five minutes. All right. So this one I thought was timely. I, I know John John always goes for the most clickbaitiest kind, if there is such a word. But there's already buzzword for today. Um, clickbaitier, yeah. I'm clickbaitier than you, man. Uh, so this one was talking about how the SEC is going to be going after companies who are claiming all kinds of AI stuff that just isn't there. It's like AI is vaporware. And the little blurb over here in the middle paragraph, it talks about how this one company claimed to be using AI to help underemployed people um, get jobs. And they had no AI at all. And anyway, so the SEC is going to be stepping in and smacking companies down because these companies are able to get greater valuations just because it looks like they're a high-tech wonder child out there, and they're not. That's my first story. Let's go. The second one, um, you know, I like this one, actually. This was interesting. I picked this one and uh, hit some misses, too. This was a good one. So activist shareholders have been, uh, they get involved in all kinds of industries. At one point, they were involved at SAP. And uh, lately, they're all over Southwest Airlines. But uh, they, they, they're... Salesforce. Yeah, they've been at, they've hit up on Salesforce. And the question on this was, do shareholders... Uh, do these activists actually trigger long-term systemic um, growth and change to companies? Well, the bottom line was no. And I have this book here. Uh, I think it was Jim Collins wrote it. Uh, yeah, Jim Collins called uh, From Good to Great. And the thesis of that book is you could bring in some superstar CEO and make all the right kind of decisions and job cuts, whatever, and reposition the company. And all of a sudden, it's making money hand over fist. But what he learned in that book is a lot of these superstar CEOs, the minute they leave, the company kind of collapses inwardly and the great returns disappear. Uh, the same thing is the issue here with these shareholder activists. They can come in and make a lot of great short-term changes, but do the changes really stick? And the, and the answer is the same thing that was in Jim Collins' book, is if you've got a high personality cult kind of around a CEO or to some of these changes the activist shareholders bring in, it's not going to it's not going to last. You need um, you need to put in more systemic changes that are going to go and go and go, and that's what's missing. Anyway, and let's go to the last story here. Yeah, and by the way, I I've put good to great still on my top five business books I've ever read, even to this date and time. That that book is still a solid read at this point. Well, I know you give me grief about always pulling stories from like uh, McKinsey and HBR and all that, but. What oh, I mean. you know, a nice one from Inc. too. Okay, what you got? So this one was, uh, it was all about a company called uh, Figma. And uh, the what happened here is they created these, they, they used AI tools, generative AI, to create code and to create prototypes of products. And right off the bat, one of the things that, that this company Figma did is it ended up creating a... Um, uh, an app that looks identical to one that Apple produces to show you the weather. And it's fairly, um, you know, it looks and feels blatantly like this could be a misappropriation of intellectual property kind of thing, but it's generating something that's just the same. What's fascinating about this article is it talks about the lack of accountability that the CEO of Figma uh, is ducking. You know, he, you know, he's not, He's not apologizing for what that AI product did, even though it looks like they may have been caught dead to rights on infringing on other people's intellectual property. This is one of those where time will tell how the story goes. But it, to me, it's one of these harsh reminders that, you know, when you use AI, just because you can use it doesn't always mean you should. And this may be one of those examples where they stepped over the line and went using it for some it, Never should happen. Yeah, and there's a bunch of pending lawsuits right now, including record labels. Right. And and there's there's a lot of unresolved legal 
issues around uh, the use of copyrighted material in training data and to what extent will fair uh, fair use uh, protect uh, copyrighted output because most of these uh, generative AI systems can be manipulated into putting out fairly verbatim content from what they've been trained on. And, uh, and then you get apologies and gymnastics from the CEOs of these AI firms, but I think there's l- some legal quagmire ahead that has yet to be resolved. And so to your point, customers must tread carefully and make the right decisions here. And they yep. need a lot of outside expert help would be my, my point of view on that. So, Brian, we have a special guest today. And yep. this came out of some back channel conversations you and I were having. And you said, this guy Lawson, he really brings it on the topic of vendor messaging and differentiation. And I think vendors are almost in a crisis right now, in my opinion, about how they're communicating their value proposition to the market. So, with that in mind, we are going to bring Lawson Abenanti into the program. Lawson, how are you doing? You may well, be Lawson, still... we have no audio from you. Hey, Lawson, you may be on mute. I think I can unmute you, though. Let's see if, how that goes. Oh, it says your mic is not connected. So work on work on your mic for a sec. Don't worry. Don't worry. Technical difficulties happen. Life goes oh, on. He doesn't have it handy. There we go. Well, I think he's got a backup option is what's going on there. So anyhow, live TV. Uh, get, getting back just quickly while Lawson gets organized here, just getting back onto your thing on shareholder activism. I think the other interesting thing around that is how the activist investors aren't as interested in, in customer value and customer impact, which is what I like to watch. So that's the other thing that I thought was interesting about that story was finally you gave me some proof points in that story that I can wave at the activist investor crowd and say, why aren't you looking at customer realities a little bit more? Because I think all long run, that's sort of the good to great theme is build a great company and shareholders are going to win too. Lawson, you want to try again? Oh, we still have you. You see, you appear to be unmuted now, so we're making some progress at least. Well, hmm. No, he's I can something. hear a little bit of them, but it's not coming through. Something's must be dialed out. Lawson, don't freak out because uh, if if it could break or go wrong, it's happened once or twice on this yeah. show. So don't worry about that. Yeah, and if this one doesn't work, then we may have you just sign off and reboot and come I'll in. Back in yeah. By the way, um, in in the comment, those of you watching, if you can just post a comment, so I know that they're coming through. I don't have to track. LinkedIn. And uh, if you if you have any top stories you've been tracking this month, that would be great. Brian, you know, the other interesting thing is that I always think about like what stories the artificial intelligence stuff is obscuring. And one of the ones you and I have covered in the past is ESG. I think another one that 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 I'm hearing a lot in the background is return to office stuff. I just talked with a CEO yeah. today. I just talked with a CEO today that is um all right, I'm going to move this other. Um, I just talked with a CEO today who's implementing uh, a more vigorous return to office strategy. And um, and I thought it was really interesting because there's so many companies that are trying to figure out how to do this and how to find the right balance. Do we want to like go back to a five-day mandatory? I think return to office and getting the mix right with talent and with workers is is a big underreported story right now. So I just wanted to mention that since we are the month in review. So let's talk about that for a moment. I'm going to be giving a talk. Um, Lawson? I think he's still fussing with his settings a little bit. Mm-hmm. Lawson, one thing you could also try is you could try a different browser. Um, try a few different things and see if anything works for you. Uh, so go on. What I was going to say, I'm doing this piece um, in anticipation of the uh, big HR tech show this fall, and it's on the dark side of HR. And I've been collecting all these um, just absolute horror stories about things. And return to office stuff um, definitely keeps popping up because of not just some of the motivations, but I'm hearing a lot of problems with people who hold multiple full time jobs. And they can get away with this simply because uh, they do everything remotely. 
they're never asked to show up in the office. They don't come in for a uh, like an all hands meeting or anything else. And they can't because they're holding down three and four, in one case, 10 full time jobs. Now, they're creating fraud on an epic level. Yeah. And, you know, and for their, if those people want to carp about, oh, the, you know, I got to return to the office, I have absolutely zero sympathy for them. Because uh, this one guy with the 10 jobs, he's on track to pull down 1.5 million this year in income uh, from salary. And he admits he gets fired from jobs every three or four weeks. Well, duh. You know, what kind of value can he be delivering? So Lawson's back for about the third time here. Any luck, Lawson? Video looks good. All right. We have two different ones for Lawson. Let's try another one. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, I think we got you on. I think we got you on the phone. Let's yeah. try. All right. So we'll we'll do the phone view. The phone view works. Okay. Thanks. Thank thanks for uh, improvising there. Much appreciated. Well, I have a Mac running Windows, and uh, I thought there might be a problem. I thought I had figured it all out, but obviously I hadn't. No worries. No worries. Oh, yeah. All good. All good. So we- we, we need to find out what marketing message he succumbed to to come up with that integration challenge. Uh, <laughs> hey, I, I have to say you guys delivered on my promise that you'd sprinkle uh, humor throughout the show. I love it. Hey, um, let me uh, uh, just get into the whole issue of what's going on with uh, um, messaging and positioning in the BI market. Uh, well, before before you do that, let's talk the positioning of your camera because we got a great view of your ceiling light. There we go. There we go. <laughs> There's just oh, uh, I'm 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 choking under pressure. I'm sorry. No, all good, <laughs> all good. If you can if you can try to leave it steady like that, that'd be good, and don't fuss with it anymore if you can avoid it. And yeah, then yeah. I got and then and then and then while you do that, let Brian tee you up a little bit, uh, Brian. Yeah, bring on so today's guest. Tell us, tell us why Lost is here. Why do we go through this just now? Why do we want to? Marie, on? Thank you so much for asking me that timely question, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Lawson. Now, I knew Lawson umpteen million years ago. Uh, he and I, and this was either I forget Lawson. It was either Mesozoic or Paleolithic era. Um, <laughs> he, he was with a company called Timeline out in Bellevue, Washington, if memory serves me right. Oh yeah. And, and uh, uh, I, that was probably one of those uh, companies that I went over and aggravated the daylights out of the management. And John knows how I can do that. Um, no, uh, yeah, uh, quite the contrary, uh, Brian. In fact, John Callahan says hi. Oh, tell him howdy back. And uh, so I knew him then. And Timeline, um, for those who don't know, that was a relatively higher end deck vax, um financial accounting s- system back in the day. So anyway, that's how we got to know each other. Later on, I knew he was doing because his heart's in marketing and um, mine is as well. That's where I have my undergrad degree in, um, and it's I had a marketing business with a university professor in college for a while. I get it. And why don't we just jump right into a couple of things uh, to set the stage, Lawson, uh, one of which is, it's my contention that too many tech marketing people take things way too damn literally. They talk in because they're very organized, logical, engineering type people, and they speak of functions and features, and, and they don't talk about uh, things in an aspirational or experiential way. Comment. Uh, in, yes, I, I agree 100%. They, they, they want to tell you about the wonders of their product. And guess what? All the buyer cares about is how are you going to solve my problem? And um, that's what's missing in a lot of the messaging out there is that ultimately uh, customer problems drive your messaging, your positioning. Uh, Well, they they should. Either either the customer problem or the customer's opportunity should be the driving deal, but not the functions and features, correct? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I talk about inwardly focused messaging and positioning versus outwardly. And, you know, inward is all about you. And again, people don't care about you. 
it, 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 if, you, if you can't tell them, oh, why, man, you're, why hurt, they, you're hurting the guy. But anyway. <laughs> if you can't tell them why they want to know more about you, uh, you've lost them. So the analogy I like to use with companies that are really failing in this regard is uh, there were two great commercials back in the 70s, one of which was uh, McDonald's put the bill of materials to the Big Mac uh, on, to music to all beef, patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. And then you had Coca-Cola went the complete opposite direction. They flew a bunch of college kids to some mountaintop in the European Alps, and they're running around singing, I like to teach the world to sing. And they weren't like standing there on this mountaintop holding up a can of Coke. And I know this is Dr. Pepper, but talking about it's made with carbonated water, high fructose corn syrup, caramel coloring, BHA, BHT, and all this other kind of stuff. That's not how you sell something to someone that makes their heartstrings sore. It's so dead on arrival when you sell functions and features. It's a miracle any of these companies in the tech sector that use that style of marketing get any business at all. Well, uh, you know, the, uh, the, one of the books I highly recommend anyone that wants to understand how uh, we make decisions is uh, Neuromarketing. Um, by far the best marketing book I've ever read. And um, it turns out that the decision-making part of the brain barely understands uh, words. And so you, a lot of you know transformation and all these complex words, they go right through uh, the decision-making part of the brain, um, whereas a simple, uh, direct uh, statement about how you solve that problem is they'll listen. So simpler is better. Well, okay, let's tw let's tweak that a little bit more. Some people take the really simple approach and just copy their messaging off of some <laughs> other, somebody else in the <laughs> in that sector. So that mimicry is not a best practice, is what I would argue. What do you think? Uh, oh, what a classic example I just came across in preparing for the show. Um, I checked the. I, I went through my assessment and checked all the positions to see whether anyone had changed it. And one, uh, there are eight companies that are claiming uh, some notion of insights. Okay, eight of the eight of the competitors are. This company positioned around the notion of insights. Now, they must either be brain dead or not paying attention to the target or. As you say, which I know I've talked to a number of B2B marketing consultants who you know talk about this uh, pension for copying people that they think are doing well. It's so far out of my my reality to believe people would do that, but clearly they're doing it. I don't know, Brian. What do you think? Well, I think there's there's trouble in River City when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, so what I'm trying to under, what I'm trying to understand here though is this seems like a, such a common sense problem, right? Because most vendors that are having some modicum of success in this market, they actually have an intimate knowledge of some issues that customers are struggling with and how to help them solve it. So what is this disconnect happening where so much of the messaging is so tone deaf? Because the way you describe it sounds so practical and obvious. Well, why do we end up with this with this garbage? I. I could be wrong, but they don't teach positioning in college. Um, and you got to learn it on the job. And a lot of people don't know how to do it. Um, and they kind of wing it or they, you know, uh, but they don't understand how people um, will listen to you. You get my point, though, right? In the sense that a lot of these vendors do have internal knowledge and know how on this. It's not like oh, they yeah. don't have it. I yeah I it, it's it, as I wrote in my 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 assessment I'm perplexed I I, I can't understand it right so it, let's it, talk a little bit of, let's talk a little bit about that right Brian because we do have a couple of slides here um, that we should show and 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 I want to get also lost into the uh, the diagrams and that you kind of put out that help to coalesce what vendors are up to in BI and FPA. But first, we have this, right? Right, the three major us, problems. Yeah, walk us yeah. through those real quick. 
Sure. The number one problem, well, it's hard to tell which one's the number one problem because they're both very, all three are very common. One is lack of differentiation. And in the BI space, uh, 11 out of the 19 vendors have a, a position common to at least one other competitor. Um, and it's true in all the markets I follow. Lack of differentiation is a, is a big problem. The other problem is you wonder whether, um, uh, well, they're, they're communicating uh, a message or a position that the, the buyer could care less about because it's not addressing their key problems. It's talking about them, as we had discussed earlier, or it's a big data dump about what they do. Uh, what you do is not a position. Um, you better be able to, people better be able to quickly understand what you do. But they, you, you need to n- tell them why they should care to learn. And then uh, consistency and repetition are maybe the most important aspects of uh, claiming a position and giving it staying power in the market. Um, and um, you want the longer you stick with your position, using it consistently and repeating key. Uh, words in your positioning statement as much as possible. Um, you, you need to spend at least 18 months. Um, ideally, I say as long as possible. For example, one of my clients, uh, you guys all would know Wayne Eckerson, Eckerson Group. Um, and I helped him position his boutique consulting firm around the notion of get more value from your, um, um, uh, data. Did I hear? Are you, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're all good. Oh, yeah, you're uh, fine. I, I, I'm hitting buttons and I'm scared that I'm screwing up. Um, uh, and, and an example of, uh, uh, and, and sometimes people change good positions uh, for poor ones. For example, I also was going through the FPNA assessment. And I had highlighted two companies that I thought were doing a great job of positioning and messaging or positioning. And um, it turns out that one of them changed from a really nice position to almost identical to the position of the company that I was also saying were doing a great job. Um, so I got to rewrite that whole uh, assessment. But got a couple of points. Oh, go yeah. ahead. The, the point is, is that they're changing their positions. And it, 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 that was the stupidest thing I ever saw. They had a good, strong position. They should have stuck with it. I want to get back into hackneyed buzzwords in a second. But um, first, a couple of show comments. Brent, welcome to the show. Sorry you missed the first half. But the good thing is you can dip into the stream anytime. Uh, Maureen, I mm-hmm. uh, want to ask you, Lawson, about Maureen's question. She does say that she agrees that um, that this stuff is not taught in college. That's part of the problem. And she says the humans writing this copy have no experience selling. And as April Dunford says, a world class sales pitch will not be created by a team of folks who have never pitched a customer. Do you think that's part of the issue there too? Well, yes. Um, the thing is, is that you can overcome that. And one of the uh, I am a big advocate. I tell my customer, uh, my clients. When you start your positioning prospect, guess where you go first? To your sales team. And you talk to them, uh, and you can learn literally everything you really need to position effectively from your sales team. But guess what? You involve them. You get their input. Um, they will then buy into the article, the materials that you create, because they had a say in the messaging that's being used. Um so I say involve sales early and often throughout the sales process, uh, the positioning process. And, um, you know, that solves a big problem. I don't know, Brian, uh, both you and John, do you agree? I think lack of alignment between sales and marketing is one of the biggest problems in, in B2B marketing and sales. So I'm going to react to a bunch of, bunch of little sound bites in here. One is, uh, to Maureen's point about they don't teach this stuff in college. I remember my college course, they were still talking about the three P's of marketing, product, place, and promotion. 
And, you know, the messaging and the branding and all that was kind of an afterthought back in the day. Second is this thing about uh, the people that, that write the copy have no experience. Another Marine comment. Um, uh, I've never seen great messaging come about through committee. It just doesn't happen. And worse, if you want to see a great example of how not to do positioning, ask the same people to do a mission statement, and they'll probably come out with the same one-line statement. You know. Um, finally, on that point, I would add, uh, a lot of companies, where they go wrong is the product marketing people who are marketing individual like applications or subsuites. They seem to have a disproportionate kind of amount of influence on what the overall messaging will be about the company. And the two couldn't be any further uh, apart from that. And uh, those are those are just some of the kind of errors that happen out there. Um, and I do want to say that uh, Lawson's approach, where you kind of look at what is the what's the message that or the positioning coming out from the different companies in a sector, is spot on. And I did something like that in my career where I looked at different professional service firms and they all said the same thing. And to prove my point, I went to one of my clients, a big professional service audit and tax consulting firm, and I put up, uh, I gave them a test. I gave them, here are 11 companies in your sector. You're one of the 11. And here are the different positioning statements. Can you match any of them? And nobody could even pick out their own firm's positioning statement. Now, that is a damning <laughs> statement there. And it goes to, I think, to reinforce that, I know Lawson, you and I've talked about before, which is how do people expect prospects or sales leads, or whatever, to make any kind of a decision about your firm when you sound just like everybody else? There is no differentiation in the messaging. Why should they waste any time uh, digging in on your company to find anything else? Yeah. And as it turns out, the decision making part of the brain is looking for a reason to make a fast decision. And, and differentiation contrast help do that. On the other hand, lack of differentiation causes buyer confusion, <laughs> no, no decision, price wars, you know, the whole, the whole bit. Um, Brian, the one thing um, I'll, I'll uh, I don't know if I say I disagree, I'll just counter the notion of an individual creating the messaging. The problem with that is that um, it doesn't do you any good to come up with brilliant messaging if no one uses it. <clears throat> and the only way they'll use it and embrace it if they have had a say in it. So what I, um, I, I, what I have my clients do is they would have a, a team that does the positioning. Um, they come up with a message strategy uh, iteratively over a period of time and then socialize it with as many of the um, key stakeholders as you can. And then uh, I was director of product marketing for Navision in Denmark, and we positioned um, 12 products during an 18-month period I was there. And um, I required, first of all, I required the product teams to get me on board with their positioning because when I we because I was going to require them to go in front of management to get final approval. I mm -hmm. did that for a couple of reasons. I played golf with the founders of the company on a regular basis and I, I knew they weren't telling the same story as everyone else. So I tried to how could I get them to start telling the same story? And I realized one way to do it was to go uh, require that management approve the every message strategy, right? And that and that worked very well. And actually, that's what I uh, advocate now is, you know, management is going to wing it and tell their yep. you know their special story. Indeed. Um, hey, Maureen, um, just real quick on the yes comment because of the slight delay lag with LinkedIn. Uh, this is for all commenters. Um, yes doesn't means we don't know what you're saying yes to, but I mean, we're glad that you said yes. Cause that means you <laughs> said that you like something, but you may want to elaborate on what it is that, uh, resonated with you. Uh, and I want to encourage others in the chat to do the same. We have lost on for another 10 minutes. So if you have some questions around 
positioning in the enterprise space, especially around data, BI, FPA. These are areas that Lawson is focused on. We also lost Brian from the show for a little bit. Brian, welcome back. <laughs> How you doing? Oh, you know, I was stuck on a bad message somewhere, and uh, I no worries. Get through. Yeah. So I want to I want to dig into this buzzword issue uh, with Lawson a sec because Lawson on your slide here, you you talk about um this issue of hackneyed buzzwords, and I I want to go into one of them. Would you agree that insights has become a hackneyed buzzword? You know, sadly, yes. I'll tell you okay. a quick story about that. When I was on the management team of TM1 Software, which is now owned by IBM and is an engine behind uh, uh, IBM planning and analytics, and um, uh, <laughs> they um, uh, the the use of buzzwords. Um, oh. <laughs> So we, our um, tagline was insight on demand, which because TM1 would calculate data, huge amounts of data instantly, that was, we positioned around instant answers and then we used insight on demand. Um, I'd never rec recommend that now. I mean, there's nine vendors in the BI space they are all claiming, uh, you know, the notion of insight. All right. Then, so, so, so let me stop you for a sec there. So. So I agree. I can't stand the word insight. But if you if you have a product where you actually are trying to help companies make actionable, good decisions around data, how do you work around a hackneyed buzzword? Right? We accept that insights is a waterlogged, almost meaningless phrase. What What would you advise a company that wants to use that phrase? What should they do instead? Well, uh, just off, uh, just as a sign, I've thought about how how to substitute something for insights. It's hard to do in a lot of cases. But I think if you step back and you look at, um, again, you look at the problems and you look at how, you, you know, how you're going to communicate, how you solve them, um, you ought to be able to you know, somehow uncover a way of saying that that's not insights, but understanding, you know, um, learn whatever i don't know you know it but but you can it just is one of those challenges of um effective communications is sometimes it's not easy to come up with the right answers so right. I'll, I'll, i'm going to weigh in on that one john i think the problem is we still aren't talking about the experiential angle i think what a lot of people want is they want that what how do they feel when they get like an instant answer an instant insight they feel great relief, but they also might be able, because the answers are instantaneous, they can go home early that day. They can enjoy <laughs> their weekend. You know, they get their life back. Those are the kind of experiential kind of <laughs> moments that are in, that are powered by that kind of technology. The instant insight is still talking about a technology answer to a as yet unarticulated um, business problem. And I think that's where the marketing goes haywire is it. it it falls back on functions and features like a crutch as opposed to talking about the real yep. change in the user experience. But anyway. And, and by the oh. way, I'm by the way, I'm banning the use of the terms intelligent, smart, and co <laughs> and, and co-pilot as well. It's back to the drawing board, folks. Um, these systems are not intelligent. I'm sorry, they are not. They're not co-pilots. If you let them fly your plane, they're gonna fly it right into the wall. How about so, savvy? <laughs> Right. So, right. I mean, and and I also think, too, that companies are also afraid to to embrace their industry aspects. So embrace your industry chops instead of insights. How about insights for for automotive manufacturers that are in the crunch right now and need to reinvent? Like, like let's get a little more specific. Here's another thing that I think is interesting is on, on the differentiation when I talk with vendors about this, and I'm interested, Lawson, in your comments on this. I think so often companies are afraid to to really back up their sharpest differentiating points. Like, so pricing is a big one because I work with a few companies that I think have much, much better pricing schemes than anybody else. Like much less friction, not tied to user seats, stuff like that. And I'm like, why aren't you making a ton of noise about this? Because don't you realize how much angst and frustration there is around the contractual notion of doing business in the enterprise? Why don't you make noise about that? Whereas if you want to say, well, we've got AI, or we've got, you know, your analytics insights. It's like, well, 
but so does everybody else. I think sometimes companies overlook what actually makes them special. Uh, yeah. Um, this is where the little soul, soul searching helps. Um, and, you know, really diving into uh, what you're good at, um, you know, where, where you really excel. Um, but, I, you know, none of this is easy. And sometimes it does take a lot of time to, to hone in on where you need to be. But uh, the effort is well worth it because, you know, otherwise you just get lost in the sea of sameness. Right. So, and, and Brent raises an interesting point as far as would vendors have anything to say if they couldn't use buzzwords? I, I mean, obviously, we're never going to purge this industry of buzzwords. That's naive. But if I hear you correctly, you're you're talking about just putting a lot more thought and intention into how these things are used. And and for example, I think sometimes if you if you're a little sarcastic about some of your buzzwords and laugh at them a little bit, <laughs> that's another way of using them without overusing them, right? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to talk about intelligent systems again. <laughs> we know we've been hammering you about this or whatever. It kind of like a little humor in that conversation, I think, really helps, too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The the, uh, the buzzword that drives me crazy is transformation. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, in fact, I had a post on it uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, you know, a transformation is from one extreme to an I mean, one form to an extremely different form. And I don't know about you, Brian, the only transformation I can think of is BlackBerry. They went from a cell phone company to a data security company. But beyond that, no one proves it. You know, they say it. And that's the real problem in effective communications. If you just say it and you don't prove it, People are not going to listen. They want to know why. How do you do it? Tell me, how, you know, how you do it. That's how they're going to make a decision. I wish we had the link up right now, John, to astounding ERP. Yeah, because John and I did a uh, we did a fake infomercial of a fake ERP product, and the whole thing was about four minutes of nonstop buzzwords uh, huh. because it's the most amazing product. It'll slice, dice, you make julienne fries out of your old backup tapes. You know, anyway, we had it all in there. Anyway. On a very sarcastic note, Uber <laughs> transformed from a self-driving company to a company that exploits gig economy workers at the slimmest margins possible. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I want to uh, make sure that your audience here, because we're going to wrap your segment in a few minutes, gets a little more of a feeling for some of the stuff you do. So here's an example of how they can dig deeper with you. You 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 put together these messaging maps. You have one for F financial planning and analysis too, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so so just talk briefly about this and how um and how viewers can get a little more uh, deeper into this. Like, can they go to your website and stuff? Yeah, I explain on my website how to determine how companies are positioned. Um, but this uh, competitive map makes it easy to see how you're positioned relative to everyone else. But you use it when you're doing your brainstorming for your positioning statement. And then you can look at your positioning statement and see whether anyone else is making that claim. If they're not, then you've found the right positioning statement. If they are, you go back to the drawing board what I ask my clients to do is rank problems, let's say the top five, six, seven problems. And you might have to go to the fifth problem before you find something unique. Um, but that's how you would converge on it. Um, and uh, I usually do these, uh, you know, for example, uh, it's pretty easy for me to pull them together. And it's easy for anyone to because positioning is done in public. It's right there on their website. You go to their homepage, you look for their main claim, and sometimes you can't find it because it, you know they're not doing a good job of positioning. But that's it, that's actually a great soundbite that positioning is out there in public, and anybody can do it. And I think that's mm -hmm. that's that's a great bite right there. And 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 then you ask yourself, how could someone then have the same position as a competitor? You know, it just it boggles my mind, actually. Um, so um, 
and then I also have in this assessment, I do a uh, breakout of the uh, insight claims. Um, and, and then I also break out the transformation claims. Um, primarily, um, you know, this was really for a, 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 my, my own assessment, um, but it is really important to understand how your competitors are positioned. And not only that, but to pay attention to it on a regular basis. Because when someone changes their position, something's going on. There's either a management change and a change in direction, new VP of marketing, new C CRO, something's going on that's caused them to change. So that's when you need to look at your competitor in a lot more detail and figure out what's going on. Indeed. Brian, last question for Lawson. We're just about to wrap this segment. Well, so for the tech buyer that's on the uh, podcast today, after hearing all this, and they're probably sitting there going, man, these technology people, they don't know the first thing about marketing, positioning, whatever. Why do I care? Why does a end buyer care about this? If That's they care at all. You know, um, they may not realize they care. Because um, what's happening, uh, you know, uh, research says that up to 80% of the buyer decisions are uh, a buyer journey is completed before they reach out to a sales professional. Yeah, that so, was in the challenger sale. Yeah. Dixon's if, you book. if you're not delivering differentiated value at every touch point, um, your chances of having them put you on the short list are greatly reduced. On the other hand, if you're consistently repeating your differentiated value everywhere they go, your chances, and you're addressing their key problems and you're showing them how you solve their problems, your chances of winning the deal are much higher. Um, mm. So it's right. very, very important. Brian, I think the other interesting thing too, along these lines, I've, taught, I've, I've written about this topic. I wrote a 60 pager on the so-called informed buyer, but I, I talk with Hank Barnes at Gartner a fair amount about this because he spends a lot of time on this. And one of his really interesting points is that Lawson, like how you described the buyer spending so much time on their own, that's for sure. But buyers are also spending a lot, putting a lot more weight into their actual interactions with a, with a vendor when they do happen. And I think that's where some of this stuff really comes home to roost because like you said, Lawson, if you're getting consistent messaging from a brand and, and you're getting a more authentic and less buzzword laden type of discussion about business problems and how you solve them, then I really like I like that vendor's chances. And I think for a buyer, they're going to gravitate towards vendors like that. And so I think that's that's a big part of it is that buyers don't trust this type of over massaged, over buzz, over hyped marketing. <laughs> they want something a little more authentic than that, and they judge you based on those interactions. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think now we're at a point where if we're going to talk about the authentic vendor, that's probably a subject for another call. Another it podcast. is indeed. It is indeed. <laughs> so well, I think, well, I think Lawson, what I'm saying suddenly is, Lawson, we're going to have to bid you a fun to do. And, uh, we're we're not we're not out of topics, but we're out of time is basically what it comes down to. Thanks, Lawson. You were terrific. Thanks hey. for uh, overcoming your technical thing and making it work. It yeah, beautiful. well, I appreciate you having me on. It was a real pleasure. Much appreciated. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Catch guys. you later. See you. Bye. Yeah, that was good, Brian. That was a refreshing. Um, I think we do have to digest Brent's comment here. Uh, Brent went off. Thought and attention should lead to better and less worked words than what is foisted onto us every minute, which means we'll probably never break that chain. We'll continue getting deluged with insightful disruption that will transform our lives with better personalized experience. He Brent, took that right out of the uh, of the uh, software, fake software company we did. Indeed, amazing ERP, right? Uh, yeah. astounding, astounding ERP. Astounding, astounding, astounding ERP. right. Brent, um, sounds like you need a weekend. Um, I hear you, man. Uh, we all got to unplug a little bit from the, the buzzword festival. But in, in all serious in all seriousness, I think Brent, you're you're largely right. But I do think there is such a thing as doing a better job with this stuff and in doing worse. And delivering more customer value versus delivering less customer value. And the, the day that I stop believing that, I have to quit and leave this industry. So 
So yeah, well, we, we, are, we, we are all... trying a little bit. We're, we're trying to like hold on to a, a shred there, uh, a shred of hope, Brent. So you can't totally cut that off, man. You can't totally cut that off. So to Brent, and I think we all owe a hat tip to Frank Scaffo and his buzzword bingo cards uh, that he passed out one year. Indeed. So, and by the it, way, Frank Frank uh, posted news this week that he is retiring officially uh, from uh, his 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 um, full time consulting Avisant. endeavors. Yeah. With Avasant, and but he's going to keep blogging on the Enterprise Spectator, and he actually yep. just wrote a post on building an independent consulting firm, which is worth a look for some of the thoughts on independence, which is always a potent topic in our industry. Brent says. He's just getting revved up to do battle with John Lawson. Oh yeah, Brent, you better bring your A game with John because John John will argue you right out of your chair if you don't. By the way, folks, uh, when you drop off this call, I encourage you to check out Brent and Lawson going at it on Friday. They always find something interesting to talk about. Brent, feel free to post the topic in the chat if you have one. Brian, we well, have a little bit more, don't we? We got what do we? Yeah, we've, I was going to say, don't let people shouldn't drop off yet. We've still got some lighthearted stuff here. Oh um, yeah, we got we got my whiffs of the month. Uh, mm-hmm. These these some of these are they're picked out of uh, the Enterprise Hits and Misses collections. This one, uh, I I was being a little uh, extra snarky around who says you have to choose facial recognition facial recognition at checkout convenient or creepy. I said both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that uh, line from the piece. I don't want surveillance technology to pick up on my depressed mood over the increasingly worrying state of the world and offer me a discount on cookies. Mm-hmm. I thought that was uh, that's um that that's not AI generated the, the, writing right there. Let's just say that the, the fact that real human beings are actually watching you when you use those self scanning checkouts just kind of tells me how bad that technology has failed. What's your next with? Oh yeah, and then we've got this. A lot of people responded to this one: the car rental service that replaced replaced de- desk agents with people on video chat. We're seeing a little more of this trend of the employee free store. I'm sure you love this concept, Brian. I mm-hmm. need to speak with a manager, and I and I, I wrote, um, "Sure, join the Zoom call already in progress," which is actually kind of what you do. You go into an office if you have talked to manager. <laughs> you need to talk to this remote manager. I love that. It's like. Where are my rental car keys? Uh, well, I've got them right here on the Zoom call. Uh, this is great. Um, how, anyway, how about how about you and I update that Seinfeld episode? You know where he and Elaine are trying to get a rental car, and he's talking talking to the reservation person. You know how to take the reservation. You just don't know what to do with the reservation. Exactly. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure these uh, virtual ones are going to make it work. Folks, we've got to say a fond adieu to my old workhorse printer. Um, we've, we're having a memorial service. It, wow. It's on a pile here on the floor. And two that looks head. like an eBay special to me. Well, two, Real uh, nice. two consecutive printhead failures, and we had to put it on, you know, um, on not, not live support. We had to move it straight to... Uh, what did I put on there? But anyway, uh, don't send any flowers or anything like that. But just know that that poor old uh, Office Jet Pro from HP is with us no more now. That puppy was a workhorse, man. Think of all the NDA agreements that thing printed out over the over the years. You know, <laughs> it, yeah, it got it got pounded on pretty heavily. All right, and what else do we have, John? Something that inspires and creates value. Oh, man. Now, this is always our toughest slide. Yeah, because we don't see a whole lot every week in this regard. But I I was going to just share something. I did a piece that came out today, uh, but I've been working on for about two weeks. And I just wanted you all to know that uh, I... I beat up on a on the vendor Sage pretty good at their analyst event a week and a half, two weeks ago. and. Uh, where I was trying to find out was how far the, the, you could push the envelope with their intact package on performance. Uh, I kept with them after that event, and I found out uh, a ton of great stuff, and I published a nice piece on that. But that was one that there was a story. It was just sub rosa. It wasn't getting out there, and I, I poured some serious fuel on it, and it looks like, um, you know, They've got a really good story to tell. And yeah, um, by the done. way, that's a that's that's also a shameless plug opportunity for Diginomica because that's where you will see the story. Uh, 
So thanks for that, Brian. And, 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 and I think you, you make a really good point, which is that I still, I still think that the most interesting stuff that any of us that are in our line of work, you, me, various variations can do is the original stuff, right? Yeah. Is, is stepping away from the standard narratives and reacting to keynotes and reacting to vendor news and digging into issues, which is what you did this time where you really were looking at what does performance and scale look like in this particular market, which is more SME like mid-mark. What does that really mean? And and you had a chance to really dig into that with customers and with the vendors, et cetera. And um, that's great. And you know we don't get enough of that in this day and age. And that's the kind of stuff that, I'm sorry, you just cannot get that from your automagical AI system. It's not going to spit that out. It can't do no, it. No, but astounding ERP, the you know the thing that you see as advertised on TV, it can deliver that kind of value up and down the value chain anyway. Anything well, else that inspires and creates value, feel feel free to post that in the chat. I, I occasionally find stuff that inspires on YouTube, especially I, I lately my the algorithm's been showing me a lot of catch and release of rehabilitation of wild birds like eagles and stuff like that. I'm a sucker for that. Oh, I thought it was capture and release techies, but okay. Oh ahead. no, no, no. It's like it's like, you know, wild birds, you know, and like re- rehabbing them and then release the release back into the wild and stuff like Oh my gosh, that um, I gotta have a couple Kleenexes handy when I see those birds fly off like that. That 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 does me in every time. It's like it's guaranteed. So, all right, I think we're done, Brian. I, w- I want to thank all of our uh, vocal audience members for making this show what it is. Thank you. Y- you guys make it worthwhile to prepare this each time. So, really appreciate you out there, Brian. Any final words to our lovely audience? Um. Uh- I always appreciate the interesting comments and and that's from the heart. I really do. And, uh, uh, and I even, I even more so appreciate the ones where they try and make us laugh. So thanks for that as well. When they, when those pop in and a big thanks to Lawson. I know he had some technical problems, but by and large, I thought the show went pretty good. That would be my guess. Yeah. yeah. Thanks all the way around everybody. By the way, Lawson, if you're still backstage, feel free to hang out for a few. We'll, uh, we'll chat, chat you up for a minute before we head out. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. See you you next month.